Well, the reading today is from Genesis chapter 13, and you'll find that in your Bibles at home or on the screen or in the service sheets that you might have printed off. Let me read Genesis 13, and then we're going to spend some time together looking at it. Then Abram went up from Egypt to the Negev, he, his wife, and all he had, and Lot with him. Abram was very rich in livestock, silver, and gold. He went by stages from the Negev to Bethel, to the place between Bethel and I, where his tent had formerly been, to the site where he had built the altar. And Abram worshipped the Lord there. Now Lot, who was travelling with Abram, also had flocks, herds, and tents. But the land was unable to support them as long as they stayed together. For they had so many possessions, they could not stay together. And there was quarrelling between the herdsmen of Abram's livestock and the herdsmen of Lot's livestock. At that time, the Canaanites and Perizzites were living in the land. Then Abram said to Lot, Please, let's not have quarrelling between you and me or between your herdsmen and my herdsmen, since we're relatives. Isn't the whole land before you? Separate from me. If you go to the left, I'll go to the right. If you go to the right, I'll go to the left. Lot looked out and saw that the entire Jordan Valley, as far as Zoar, was well watered everywhere, like the Lord's garden and the land of Egypt. This was before God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. So Lot chose the entire Jordan Valley for himself. Now Lot journeyed eastward, and they separated from each other. And Abram lived in the land of Canaan, but Lot lived in the cities of the valley and set up his tent near Sodom. Now the men of Sodom were evil, sinning greatly against the Lord. After Lot had separated from him, the Lord said to Abram, Look from the place where you are. Look north, south, east and west, for I'll give you and your offspring forever all the land that you see. I'll make your offspring like the dust of the earth, so that if one could count the dust of the earth, then your offspring could be counted. Get up and walk from one end of the land to the other, for I'll give it to you. So Abram moved his tent and went to live beside the oaks of Mamre at Hebron, where he built an altar to the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, you'll have a sermon outline there in your service sheet, so you can write notes, uh, use the comments box at the bottom of the page to send any questions or feedback you might like to. How do you look at life? I remember a few years ago, just after the attack in Paris on a group of journalists, Charlie Hebdo, there was much analysis of Islamic terrorism and its view of the world. The world's a battlefield. The battle is for the honour of Islam. The opponents are all those who are not Islamic. Glory and the end of the world are received and hastened by armed violence. If you view the world this way, then certain actions are inevitable, or at least expected. It's often the way. How we view the world, the eyes we use to look at the world, necessarily affects our behaviour. Let me say that again. How we view the world necessarily affects our behaviour. At the heart of today's passage is an occasion of two men looking, searching the world intently with certain kinds of eyes. On one level, it's basically a story of how two men sort out their differences, their agricultural arguments. On another level, it's a reminder of the importance of how we view the world. What eyes do we use to look at this world? Let me pray, and then we'll dive into it together. Dear God, thanks for your word. We're returning to Genesis, back to that primary book, if you like, the first book, back to the way in which you establish the world and how we see your purposes and the brokenness and your commitment. Our Father, it really is very distant from us in time, geography, custom, but it's not distant from us because it is your word. And we are your people. Please speak to us through it today. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, today we're returning to Genesis, uh, the first book of the Bible. Uh, It lays out the beginning of all things, doesn't it? Uh, The creation by God in order, out of nothing, by his word, according to his design. It lays out the purpose of all things. Uh, The purpose of all things is to rest with God, under his word, with his people. Uh, It lays out the cause of the breaking of the world and what a broken world looks like. Uh, The world was broken by sin, human sin. The attitude and action that says, I'm God and God's not, as Super Steve reminded us so memorably last week. 
It lays out the judgment and grace of God. It lays out the commitment of God through the family of Abram to roll back sin and its brokenness, to bring back God's approval, God's people in God's place under God's rule by his word. Remember, we looked at all that last year in Genesis 1 to 12. And when we finished last year, Abram, his name won't change till Genesis 17, Abram had had a disastrous journey into Egypt. Now, Egypt had not gone well for him. I'm at point two on the outline. Uh, His trip to Egypt had offended Pharaoh. Abram's wife had been dishonoured. Abram had been exposed as a frail and fallible human like the rest of us. Pharaoh's soldiers have frog-marched Abram and his family's goods out of Egypt. He is not welcome there. As he returns to the land of Canaan, he returns a dishonoured but wealthy man. Look at verses 1 to 4. Then Abram went up from Egypt to the Negev, he, his wife, and all that he had, and Lot went with him. Abram was very rich in livestock, silver, and gold. He went by stages from the Negev to Bethel, to the place between Bethel and I, where his tent had formerly been, to the site where he'd built the altar, and Abram worshipped the Lord there. And we need to recognize how wealthy Abram truly is. In modern day terms, he's a man of significant assets and with significant cash in the bank. On every level, he is wealthy and very much so. His return to the land of Canaan is one of stages. He starts down in the bottom southwest corner in the Negev Desert, and he travels slowly back up to the place where he had been living when the famine described in Genesis 12 struck the land. This is a man coming home. But he's also a man coming home in terms far more significant than his postal code. Did you notice verse 4? Let let me read it again. Abram came to the site where he'd built the altar, and Abram worshipped the Lord there. Abram's return not only to the place where he had pitched his tent, he's also returned to the place where he had positioned his life. Abram has returned to the altar that he'd set up back in Genesis 12, verse 8. From there he moved on to the hill country east of Bethel and pitched his tent with Bethel on the west, I on the east. There he built an altar to the Lord and worshipped him. Verse 4 is a significant statement where Abram returned to on a number of levels. First, it should cast our minds back to what we've already read about Abram. Abram's the recipient of three significant promises from God that God will give him a large family, a nation, a land for that family to dwell in. And through this man's family, God will bless the world. In fact, this, this is God's plan to restore his own broken creation, a world which he created so that he could dwell with humanity and rest in his place, so that he could bless them by ruling over them with his word. Human sin had broken all that, hadn't it? Damaged and broken God's will brought God's right and fair judgment of death. But God hasn't neglected his creation, has he? God promises to restore the world, and it will be through Abram and his family. Through Abram's mob, God will bring his perfect mix of justice and mercy in dealing with human sin. Second, Abram responded to God's promises rightly by trusting God. He took him at his word and lived like it. So Abram set off for this land that God had promised in Genesis 12. When he got there, he did two significant things. He built altars and worshipped God, Shechem in the north, Bethel in the middle. Second, then he toured down to the Negev at the far south of the land. Now, Abram faced some significant obstacles, didn't he, in trusting God's plan. He had a wife who was barren, Sarai. And the land that God had promised him was already occupied. But his initial journey, if you cast your minds back to Genesis 12, 1 to 9, his initial journey into this new land was a significant statement that he trusted God to do as God had promised. He looked at the land through eyes that trusted the promises of God. So third, when Abram returns to the land, and immediately makes his way back to one of those original altar sites and then worships God, the Lord, it's a significant moment we mustn't miss. I think we're meant to see that Abram has recommitted himself after his cunning and failed plan in Egypt, recommitted himself to the promises that God had given him. 
the cunning plans had failed. The human ingenuity only led downwards. Abram seems to have learned his lesson. Rather than approaching the world in the normal, shrewd, cunning way that it enriched him so far, he now seems to be explicitly stating with his life actions that he's coming back to camp under the promises of God. And he'll look at the world through those eyes. Now, Abram's nephew Lot's reappeared at this point, hasn't he? I'm at point three on the outline. The focus in Egypt was an Abram, and so Lot was not mentioned. But Lot's now mentioned twice in the opening verses. It seems to suggest that he's going to play a major part in the next section of this narrative. Look there in verse five. Now, Lot was traveling with Abram, also had flocks, herds, and tents. But the land was unable to support them as long as they stayed together, for they had so many possessions that they could not stay together. And there was quarrelling between the herdsmen of Abram's livestock and the herdsmen of Lot's livestock. At that time, the Canaanites and Perizzites were living in the land. Now, Abram had received the promises of God. Through Abram, God had committed himself to bringing salvation to the world. But there are significant obstacles, aren't there? I've already mentioned too, Sarai, Abram's wife, is barren and so the prospect of a massive family and an abundant nation seems far-fetched. The land that God's promised is already occupied. The Canaanites and Perizzites are there. Abram's excursion into Egypt raised other problems and now in the form of love we've got another obstacle. The land's not big enough for the two of them. It's like some western, isn't it? Now Lot's not a man of insignificant resources. He, he, he is a wealthy man too. There in verse 5, he's mentioned as having flocks, herds, and tents. Now, he's not very rich like Abram. He's well tied up in assets. Perhaps that's why he's not branched out on his own, but he is wealthy. In fact, his assets and Abram's assets are now competing and creating conflict. It's a significant problem for Abram and the promises of God. There's another contender for the land, and He's actually connected to Abram's family, so he's not outside the realms of possibility. Could he kick Abram's family out? Could he destroy his uncle and take the land? And what about those already in the land, the Canaanites and Perizzites, who are watching all of this family feud unfold and planning a corporate takeover at the point of a spear? What will Abram do? What cunning plan will he develop? How will he use his considerable business smarts to solve the problem? Look at verse 8. Then Abram said to Lot, Please, let's not have quarrelling between you and me, or between your herdsmen and my herdsmen, since we're relatives. Isn't the whole land before you? Separate from me. If you go to the left, I'll go to the right. If you go to the right, I'll go to the left. I'm at point four on the outline. That's not what we expected. I wouldn't call that a cunning plan. Uh, in baseball parlance, that's a curveball. Well, we must remember that Abram had every right to kick Lot out of the land. Abraham was Abram was more senior, the more wealthy member of the family. If he wanted to play the God card, Abram had every right. God had made the promises to him. Abram's in the position of familial, cultural, social, and religious superiority here. And yet, this is his plan. He's generous. He's humble. He's kind, he's thoughtful, he's seen to preserve relationships. He's a completely different man to the one that we saw acting in Egypt. What's brought about this change? What's engineered such a remarkable transformation in Abram? I think the key lies in verse 4. Again, let me read it. Abram returned to the site where he'd built the altar, and Abram worshipped the Lord there. Let me put it very simply. Abram trusts God. And so he behaves like he trusts God. Let me say that again. Abram trusts God. And so he behaves like he trusts God. Abram trusts the promises of God. It shows in how he behaves. Because God's promises are firm, because God has shown himself to be consistently faithful already in keeping those promises, Abram trusts him and acts accordingly. Abram can be generous because God has been generous to him. Abram can be humble because God has shown him generosity he does not deserve. Abram can be kind 
because God has extended to him unwarranted kindness. Abram can afford to hold on to his material possessions lightly because God has been overwhelmingly generous to him. And so instead of looking at the world and this obstacle of a nephew called Lot and all of his assets, instead of looking at the world and Lot through the eyes of a cunning and ingenious human plan, Abram looks at the world through trust in the promises of God. Abram trusts God. Abram looks at the world as if he trusts God. Abram behaves as if he trusts God, and so Lot steps up and he takes a look. I'm at point five on the outline. In fact, the looking language is very prominent in these verses. It's as if the author, Moses, is trying to draw our attention to the way in which these two men looked at the world around them. Our attention is drawn to the way in which what we believe, how we look at the world, affects how we see and therefore how we live. Lot steps up and he has a look, a very close look. Look at verse 10. Lot looked out and saw that the entire Jordan Valley, as far as Zoar, was well watered everywhere, like the Lord's garden and the land of Egypt. This was before God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. So Lot chose the entire Jordan Valley for himself. And Then Lot journeyed eastward and they separated from each other. Abram lived in the land of Canaan, but Lot lived in the cities of the valley and set up his tent near Sodom. Now the men of Sodom were evil, sinning greatly against the Lord. Lot looks east. The land is magnificent. Any plot of land described as being like the Lord's garden has to be a good bit of grazing land. It's well watered, which is crucial in a region known for drought and famine. And so budding pastoralist that he is, Lot looks and decides, the best pastures for me. Now, on any natural level, he's made a sound decision, has he? You can almost hear the bank manager applauding his client's wisdom as he signs off on the loan agreement. And yet. And yet. I don't think it's a mistake to see another description of the land there attached to the Lord's garden. The land's also like the land of Egypt. Now, given the delta, that means it's good land for growing mobs of sheep and for pasture. But as soon as we hear Egypt, we're meant to have our minds cast back to the disastrous episode we've just seen there. And there's a continued reference to a certain byword for immorality and sin and human rebellion against God. There in verses 10, 12 and 13, Sodom and Gomorrah. Sodom and Gomorrah. Sodom and Gomorrah. Now the original readers of this text, the, the Israelites, would have heard those names and shuddered. That's a place that any child of God steers well clear of. That's a byword for perversion, corruption, sin at its most vile. It's even made its way into modern parlance to describe the same things. And yet, for the sake of good pasture, for the sake of secure water rights, for the opportunity to get ahead in his financial pursuits and build his agricultural and pastoral interests, for the sake of his business empire and investments, Lot takes that land. Moreover, he doesn't just take that land. He then pitches his tents in the shadows of the town of Sodom. Listen to the description in verse 13. Now the men of Sodom were evil sinning greatly against the Lord. Lot looked, Lot saw, Lot decided. He's a lot like us. I think we've given enough hints here about how Lot looked at life, the eyes through which he viewed the world. It's a way of seeing and living that seems right, that is naturally sensible on the surface, but See the foolishness exposed here, don't you? I mean, why would you camp there? Why would you expose yourself to such risk, even for the success of the empire you were building? Why would you overlook the real risk of camping in the shadows of Sodom in order to gain the real estate that is right next door? Lot looked, Lot saw, Lot decided. Poor Abram. On a natural level, Abram seems diddled, doesn't he? He's made a gross 
tactical, financial, and pastoral error. Financially, he seems to have shot himself in the foot. Tactically, he's allowed his nephew to get the business edge on him. He's blown a significant opportunity to grow the empire and let loose the best pastoral grounds in the area, failing to get ahead, failing to take advantage of his opportunities. What a foolish man. What a goose. How silly. But that's not the view of the author. Did you get the hint there in verse 12? Abram lived in the land of Canaan. But Lot lived in the cities of the valley and set up his tent near Sodom. Abram lived in the land of Canaan. Now that is such an important phrase. Lot gets the pastoral land. Abram gets the promised land. Lot looks after himself. Abram looks to God. Lot exposes himself to the sinful stew and shadows of Sodom. Abram stays put. Lot is a wise fool. Abram's just plain wise. That phrase, Abram lived in the land of Canaan, reminds us that Abram has been brought back under the obedience to the promises of God. Abram's eyes are remarkably different. His view of the Lord is founded on the promises of God, the character of God. Look at verses 14 to 17. After Lot had separated from him, the Lord said to Abram, Look from the place where you are. Look north and south and east and west, for I'll give you and your offspring forever all the land that you see. I'll make your offspring like the dust of the earth. So that if one could count the dust of the earth, then your offspring could be counted. Get up and walk from one end of the land to the other, for I will give it to you. Abram now looks. Abram now sees. And Abram lives accordingly. He stands in the very same place as Lot. He looks not just at the best real estate, he looks at the whole land laid out before him. And as he does, the Lord speaks to him. And God reminds him of his promise. I've promised you this land. I've promised you your great family. And through that, I will bless the world. Abram. Walk through the land looking at it through the eyes of the promise of God, not through the eyes of the budding pastoralist. If Lot looked at the world through natural eyes, Abram is called to look at the world through the eyes of faith. Left on its own, that's a meaningless platitude. Many in the world want to live by faith. Just hop on Facebook and you'll see how many live by faith. And it means just about anything. But that's not the case with Abram. Abram looked at the world through eyes of faith, and that faith was specific and clear. It was trusting in the promises that God had made, trusting that God could and would fulfill what he had said, trusting that God would do just as he promised. That's what we mean when we say looking at the world through the eyes of faith that we trust that God will do as God has promised. And so Abram settles down under that promise. Look at verse 18. So Abram moved his tent and went to live beside the oaks of Mamre at Hebron, where he built an altar to the Lord. The bookends of the passage are clear. At either end, Abram comes in, settles down, secure under his trust in God. His life is settled under what God has promised. And then he gives God what he deserves. He worships him. He gives God what he deserves. The obstacle to the promise is overcome by trust in God and camping under that trust, under the promises of God. The obstacles aren't overcome by a cunning plan. Well, Jesus looked at the world through the very same eyes. I'm at point six on the app. The great, 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 and we could go on, descendant of Abram. Remember Matthew chapter 1, verse 1. Right at the start of his public word stood a lot like Lot and Abram and looked out at the world. It was a vital proving moment for his life, the work that God had sent him to do. What eyes will Jesus look at the world through? What impact will this have on his life? And in essence, that's what happens in the temptation of Jesus at the start of Matthew and Luke's biography of Jesus. The devil presents Jesus with three opportunities to look at the world through the devil's eyes, naturally. 
by all worldly accounts, wisely. The devil presents Jesus with three opportunities to prove himself, to succeed, to achieve what he came to do, to show that he was the son of God. It just means camping under the shadows of Sodom. Much easier than God's plan. Bring much quicker success. Be far less painful than rejection, humiliation and death. It will look successful. It will smell like success. It will look like trusting the promises of God, but Jesus reveals the eyes that he uses. Three times he rejects the offer of the devil. Three times he quotes God's clear promises and commands. Three times he bids the devil leave him. Three times he shows that he's looking at the world through the eyes of faith, trusting the words, plans and promises and actions of God. I'm so thankful Jesus did that. Jesus, like his great ancestor Abram, was looking with eyes of faith. And then he fulfilled the very promises he was trusting in. He's the culmination of the plan and promise of God made to Abram, under which Abram camped. Because Jesus died for our sins, we can be reconciled to God. We can be made God's mob, God's people living with God under God's rule in God's land. That is the great fulfillment. That's the great reminder of the goodness of pitching our tents like Abram under the promises of God. That's a reminder of how significant, how crucial it is to look at the world through the right eyes then turns us back to the contrast at the heart of the account we've just read. We must see this contrast between Lot and Abram. As we give thanks for the fulfilment of God's plans by Jesus, who looked at the world through the eyes of faith, we must also consider the very same question for us as we follow Jesus. Here it is. What eyes do we use to look at the world? And Lot stands there, doesn't he? a reminder of the fallacy and fallibility of looking at the world through certain eyes. It's foolishness to look at life so that you can succeed in natural ways, but you've pitched your tent next to Sodom. That is just dumb, unwise, foolish. That behaviour is to portray and reveal what our eyes really are about. And the temptation is constantly there. In work, in family decisions, in marriage, in relationships, in leisure, in education, in parenting, in sport, in all those areas, all those areas of life, what eyes are we using? What actions do they lead to? The opportunity might be good in all natural senses, but is it the way that camps under the promise of God or the shadow of Sodom? You see, God promises time and time again. Remember Matthew 6. God promises time and time again to provide all that his people need to be his people. It might not be success. It might not be ease. It might not be progress and promotion in a natural way. But it is the promise of God. He's done it once through Jesus, dealing with our greatest problem of sin, transferring us from the domain of darkness into the kingdom of God's Son, he will continue to do it. If we trust God and his promise, if we view the world through eyes that trust God and his promise, then we can have no concern about God providing what we need to be his mom. In that sense, looking at the world through those eyes of faith can lead to a way of life that, like Abram in this episode, is exceedingly generous. Here then's the root, if you like, the source of true generosity and humility. I trust that God will do as he says. He already has in Jesus. So that means I can be generous with what I have, humble in what has been given to me. Here is the evidence of people who look at the world in a certain way. People who camp under the promise of God and not in the shadow of sorrow. Let me pray. Dear God, thank you for your word.
But thank you that in this simple account of land being divided up and a family feud being sorted in terms of agriculture and resources, we're given a searching question of the eyes we use to look at the world. Father, please enable us, just like our Saviour did, to be people who camp under the promise of God. Your promise that you'll give us all that we need to be your people. The promise that you will do with our sin and roll back the curse. Father, protect us from the lure of camping in the shadow of Sodom. Although it looks wise, although it promises success, although it leads to possible promotion, Father, enable us to be wise and to look at the world through eyes that are camped under your promise. Amen.